Well, it's like we always say, like, my relationship with God is, uh, it's not private, but it is certainly personal. I don't see him as being human, so you can't have a human relationship with him. I that we have a personal relationship with God because of Scripture and our love for our son, Jesus. There are people who believe that that uh, uh, what shirt I put on this morning, that, that God cared what shirt I put on. That's nonsense. I do think God is so big and so vast that um, we'll never get to know him exhaustively. I felt like I heard a voice from heaven speak to my situation and tell me that everything was going to be okay. And I've lived a blessed life since then, since turning my life to God. You have to experience it for yourself. I think it's, it's something hard to describe unless you're actually willing, willing to go there. You know, I just realized we should have added a question. Does God care about the shirt you put on this morning? Yes. And some of you weren't listening. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we're in, the, as I said, the final week of our series called Explore God. If you've been with us, we've been uh, looking at some big questions. Does life have a purpose? Is there even a God? And if there is a God and he's all loving and all powerful, why does he allow evil and suffering in the world? And it, is Christianity the only way? And isn't it exclusive to claim that it's so? And is Jesus really God? Last week, is the Bible reliable? Can you trust this book to base your life on it? And all of this hopefully leading us to this question of, is God knowable? I mean, don't mean no facts about God, but a personal relationship with him. Is that possible? And if it is, how does that happen? Years ago, when I, when I, first, when I was a youth pastor here, I was volunteering as a football coach at a, the town I live in. Tavia. And uh, I really enjoyed that. I had a blast doing it. I got to know some students I wouldn't have gotten known in, inside the church, but I got to know them as a coach and some of the coaches. Um, and one of the things uh, that I did was I would take these little, make these little cards and I would put verses on them and give them to the whole team on the day of the game. The coaches, or the administration didn't seem to mind in those days and they let me get away with that. And I would tape them to the locker. I wasn't proselytizing, just a word of encouragement. You know, Old Testament stuff like, by the strength of my Lord, I will conquer my enemies. Stuff way out of context. Stick it on their locker, you know, before the game. Some of the guys that played would take the person, like put it in their helmet, like it was going to make them hit harder or something. I don't know. Um, and I would, on the back of the cards, to the kids that I coached personally, which was a defensive line, I would write personal notes to all of the guys, starters or not, all the ones that I was a personal coach for their position. I would write a little note to them each game. And I would always sign it, I believe in you, Coach Frazier. Just something, you know, to do, to try to make an impact in these, because I don't know all of them that well. And then I remember going to a graduation party uh, for one of the young men who didn't have a dad in his life, and it had, some, had a pretty rough upbringing. And he had a kind of combined graduation party with one of his buddies. It was a backyard barbecue, and I stopped by just to congratulate him and encourage him. And he was so glad. He kept asking me, are you going to come, coach? Are you going to come? Are you going to come? I said, I'll come, I'll come, you know, so... I went by his graduation party, and his mom had made this little scrapbook, you know, like moms do, and she'd uh, put stuff in there, and on the back of the scrapbook, every card I'd written him for three years was in the scrapbook, every single one, like pressed in there, neatly saved and preserved. Each one of them said, I believe in you, I believe in you, and I read those things, and I was like, wow. Most of the kids, I think they just threw them in the ground after the game, you know? And his mom came up to me, and she said, you know, he hasn't had a lot of people believe in him. Just wanted to say thank you. I don't tell you that story to, like, to praise me, but I remembered that because belief is a powerful thing. Believing in someone's a powerful thing. Belief is a really powerful thing. Today we're wrapping up our series, as I said. And when we ask the question, can you know God personally, it has everything to do with what the Bible means when it says believe. But most of us, when we hear the word believe, you think about intellectual agreement. I believe this mathematical equation is true. Or emotional confidence. I believe her when she says that she loves me. Or that my head isn't too big. <laughs> we have intellectual agreement or emotional confidence. When the Bible talks about belief, it means something much, much more deeper and profound than just intellectual agreement or emotional confidence. When it talks about belief. Biblical belief is closely linked to what the Bible calls faith. And faith always involves an encounter with Jesus, meeting God, coming to see who he is in the person of Jesus Christ, and then how you respond is the intersection of faith and belief. We'll come back to that at the end. 
But I want to take you to two stories in the Gospel of John about two radically different people who both had a remarkable encounter with Jesus and responded with belief and faith. So I, I, I've been having trouble reading, I noticed, in the last several sermons since I bought these dumb things at Walmart. I can't see you, but I can see the Bible now. So if you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 26. Some of you will know this story. It's a story of a woman at a well who meets Jesus. John 4 verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples. That's John the Baptist, by the way. Jesus is growing in popularity and the word about him is spreading. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank of it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I'll not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship what you do, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's an amazing story. We don't have nearly enough time to unpack all of it. But some of you will know this story, or it'll be familiar to you, at least the idea of the woman at the well. There are several surprising things about this encounter. First of all, the woman herself is shocked that Jesus even talks to her. Why is that? Several reasons. She, she is in every way an outsider. She's a gender outsider. As a woman, she was a lower class citizen in first century Judaism. And Samaritans were, that worshiped us, they had a very similar faith to Jew, the Jewish law, but they was, the Jews saw them as half-breeds and had corrupted the faith. And we'll get to that in a minute. She was a woman, so she's a gender outsider. She's a Samaritan, which makes her an ethnic racial outsider. Now, you, we don't, go back to the Old Testament, read First and Second Kings, and, you, and during the time of King Jeroboam, and there's this, this thing that happens in the northern kingdom where some of the people that lived in this region intermarried, built a second temple to, uh, to, a different, to the worship God in a different way, and it was like a rival temple to the one in Jerusalem. And faithful Jews saw those people as they had, were traitors to the faith. And that's the history down through the centuries of which this woman is a descendant. And so Jews hated Samaritans and saw them as unfaithful. Wouldn't even pass through that region. They called Sychar, the capital town mentioned here, as the city of fools. Jews refer to it as the city of fools. So she's a gender outsider. She's an uh, ethnic and racial outsider. She's a religious outsider. And there's one other way that she's an outsider. It says that she's there at the well to drink in the sixth hour at noon. And she's alone. Now, it's easy to miss this. Why would she be there at noon alone? 
in this culture, the ancient Eastern culture, women would go in the early in the morning and late in the day, in the cool part of the morning and the evening, to draw water for the day's use and for the evening's washing as well. And they would go, when it wasn't hot at noon, and they would go together. It was a communal event to talk about their families, to share time together. She's there alone in the middle of the day. Why is that? When you put that little fact together with what Jesus says to her about her husbands and her past, you find out she's also a moral outsider. She's got a past. The implication is the other women don't want to go to the well with her, so she goes when no one else goes by herself alone. It's no accident that Jesus is there at that time to meet this gender, moral, ethnic, racial, and religious outsider. And she has this encounter with him. She's not even asking Jesus for anything. And he asks her, doesn't he? Give me a drink. And she's like, why do you even, I can't believe this guy's talking to me. Now we should not be too quick to judge the woman. Historically, some have interpreted this passage that she was, went from guy to guy to guy and was unfaithful. That may be true. But in that culture, it was, you, a man could divorce his wife for almost any reason, almost without cause. It's also equally possible that she's been cast aside numerous times, that she's been victimized. So the point is, this is a broken woman who's in every way an outsider. And Jesus wants to meet her. She wasn't looking for God. She's just trying to get water. But God is looking for her. I've talked to a number of people over the years, even more recently, that can relate to this feeling of an outsider. I've talked to some of you who've said that you believe or you're working on your belief or you want to believe, but when it comes to church and Christians, you've always felt like an outsider. Jesus asks her for a drink and he says, if you knew, because she doesn't know yet. She doesn't know what he's talking about. In fact, it's kind of almost humorous. He's talking about living water, and she thinks he's talking about actual water. She's like, living water? None have to come to the well anymore? That's awesome. Where can I get that? And then in verse uh, 16, he, he says, go call your husband. It sounds like he changes the subject, doesn't it? Like Just like this weird non sequitur. Talking about water, go call your husband. Wait, what? He's not changing the subject. He's driving right to the heart of the subject, to what you might call her spiritual thirst, what she really longs for. To be in, to be accepted, to be loved, to be treated as somebody with dignity and worth. He's not trying to shame her. He's trying to open her up to what he wants to offer her. What he refers to as living water. We don't live in our culture with an acute sense of our uh, need for water. I mean, I know you're supposed to drink like a 300 giant glasses of water a day, it makes you healthier, but I, I don't like that. I just drink coffee instead. There's water in coffee, does that count? Anyway, we, we, don't, we don't think about it that way, but when you, I've, I've traveled in Israel and other parts of the world where it's really arid and dry, and when water's hard to find and it's scarce, there's an acute sense of living with, that water is life. Water is life. You're not gonna make it long without water. Jesus is drawing a very important parallel here. You're coming to this well because you know how much you need it. He's saying, what I'm giving you, what I'm offering you, your soul needs every bit as much and more as your body needs water. You'll shrivel up and die unless you have this living water that wells up in you as a spring. A well could be stopped up, right? Dry up. Spring will bubble up again, 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 overflowing. He's saying the peace and the grace and the joy and the forgiveness that I want to offer you, it, it never runs out. It never, it, it never dries up. It just keeps flowing. The woman, like many of us, has been drinking from the wrong well, spiritually. It's not her thirst that's the problem. It's where she's going to fill it. Thomas Traherne wrote a book called A Century of Meditations. He's a 17th century metaphysical poet. I'm sure you read a lot of those guys when you're trying to fall asleep. Anyway, he's got this, these little meditations on life and faith, and he's, one of them that's my favorite. He says, the noble inclination by which a man or woman thirsteth, I just like to say the word thirsteth, after riches or dominion, is his highest virtue when rightly guided. 
What? <laughs> Let me say it again. The noble inclination, the good desire by which you thirsteth after wealth, power, whatever it is, it's actually a high, your highest virtue when it's rightly guided. It's a deep thirst in you for significance and acceptance and belonging and love that you're trying to get at the wrong well, Treherne's saying. But when you come to the well of living water, which is Jesus, you find out that that desire has been good and it's been there all along and it's meant to drive you to him. That's what he's getting at with this woman. And then in verse 26, she, they get into this theological debate about where to worship, which all has to do with the Samaritan history. And she's confused, and he says, there's a time coming, and she goes, yeah, yeah, I don't know about that, but someday Messiah's going to come, and then he'll explain it. And Jesus goes, yeah, you're looking at him, right? <laughs> Me. He just comes right out and says it. And we don't have time to get into this, but if you skip ahead in John 4, later in the chapter, we don't, we don't see immediately what happens to her, but later in the chapter, we find out that she goes back to her hometown and tells everybody about the man who changed her life, and many Samaritans believe because of her testimony, and they find out that Jesus is the Savior of the Lord, of the world. She believes, in other words. Now, maybe some of you can relate to this woman. You don't always talk about it. You're not always conscious of it, but deep inside there is a longing in you for something more. For acceptance and significance and love and grace. And maybe like this woman, you feel like you've got a past that might exclude you. Maybe you've been beat up by some church people, spiritually, who acted in judgmental ways who turned you off to God because of their hypocrisy and self-righteousness. Maybe you've always felt like an outsider, but you long to be inside. Maybe not the building, but the family of God and his love and grace. Now let me take you to our second story. We'll come back to hers in a minute. This is also in John, one chapter back, John chapter 3. It's a story of a man named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night, so I think it should be titled Nick at Night. <laughs> I've used that joke before, but I still think it's funny. <laughs> All right, let's read this story. Just the first five verses of John 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is in almost every way the opposite of the woman. He's an insider. He's a Jewish man, he's a gender insider, he's a rabbi, he's a religious insider, he's a member, the ruler of the Jews phrase means he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest council in the land in Jerusalem and in Israel, so he's a social and political insider. He's a Pharisee, which meant he's serious about keeping the law, he's a moral insider. He's a morally upright, highly educated, socially respectable religious leader in the community. This is about as good a guy as you could find. And he comes to Jesus with what appears to be a genuine question. He comes at night because he knows it's risky to associate with Jesus. Many of his friends and his, his, the people of his party don't like this guy, Jesus, or they're nervous about him. So he goes at night because he has an honest question. And think about this for a minute. Here's a guy who's supposed to be Israel's teacher. Later on, Jesus will say, aren't you Israel's teacher? You don't know these things. So he's supposed to be the guy you go to for answers. Where does he go for answers? He goes to the right source. He goes to Jesus. And he's, he, I would put it this way. I've been thinking about his life. Even though he's highly educated, very religious, moral and respectable, he knows I'm missing something. He also has a spiritual thirst. I'm, I'm missing something. Maybe this, this new radical rabbi Jesus can help me. Give me some truth I'm missing, some aspect of my faith I can put into practice, something I, I, I need to do. And he goes to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? 
What does Jesus say? I'll tell you what he does not say. He does not say, what you need is a little more education. The guy's already educated. He doesn't say, well, what you need is um, a little more morality. He's already extremely moral. He's the standard. He doesn't say, well, what you need is a little, get your life together. This guy is successful and respected. Get more religious. He's already religious. Jesus has the audacity to say, yeah, yeah, about all the respectability and morality and, and education, you need a whole new life. You need a do-over. Think about that for a minute. It makes sense to us that Jesus would say, you need to leave behind your past failures. You need to uh, repent of your sins. You need to um, walk away from your brokenness and failure. But it's harder to get why Jesus would say, you need to lay aside your successes. You need to walk away from your uh, respectability and all the things that you think prop you up and that you're proud of. You need to lay those down too. Well, that's what he says. Hey, he doesn't even address the guy's question. Well, what must, good teacher, we know that you're from God. What's the deal? And Jesus goes, you, can't, you gotta be born again. And like the woman, he doesn't get it. Right? He thinks he's talking about actual birth. He's like, how can a man go back in the womb? I'm too big. What, just simple math. That's not even going to work, Jesus. How can you be born again when you're old? He's talking about something profound. The Samaritan woman didn't think a new life with God was possible for her, perhaps. Nicodemus doesn't think it's necessary. He's trying to add a little Jesus into his already respectable life. And I know there are some of you here that have been trying to do that. Go to church. These are good people, my kind of people. I like these messages. The music is pretty good. They've got good programs for the kids. I feel good about the wells. I'll give toward that. And you're trying to fit a little religiosity and respectability into your already pretty well put together life. It will not work. You'll never get living water that'll well up in your soul and give you joy and grace that never runs out if you're just trying to fit him in. So you gotta walk away from your brokenness and past and wounds, and you also gotta walk away from all the things that you think make you okay. John chapter one, verse 12, early, a couple chapters earlier, John is talking about what, what it means to come into the family of God, and he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, there's that word again, believed. He gave the right to become children of God. The next line is about being born again. John says, children not born of natural descent or a husband's will or the will of man, but born of God. Spiritually reborn. A whole new life. I think there are both kinds of people in the room this morning. Some of you that feel like the woman, like you've always been a little bit of an outsider. And some of you that are like Nicodemus. You've been pursuing morality and respectability and being a good person. You gotta walk away from both things if you wanna meet Jesus. Let me tell you about my brother-in-law, Luke. Luke married my little sister, Julie, who's 12 years younger than I am. I was Julie's youth pastor when she was growing up, poor girl. She was the quintessential good church girl. And when, when she got into her junior in high school, something changed. Junior and senior year, she walked away from it all. Kind of turned her back on her faith and her family in some ways. Not family so much, but faith for sure. Went off to college in Colorado and uh, just pursuing fun. Met this guy who was a Student uh, visa from, from Australia, good looking, cool accent, fell in love, got pregnant. He wasn't a believer, she was far from God. I wanted to strangle him, be the big brother. They asked if I would do their wedding. And I thought, if I say yes, I think I compromise my integrity as a minister because he's not a believer. I don't think it's two mistakes make, you know, two mistakes don't make up for the first one. 
But if I say no, I think I push my sister farther away and she's gonna end up in Australia and I might never see her again. She's already running from God in the family. And Luke, I just didn't like the guy because I saw him as hurting my little sister. But he's in process too, unbeknownst to me, God's working on his heart and he's looking at our family thinking these people are judgmental. If that's what Christians are like, I'm not sure I want in. God made a way. They got married in a church that required their pastor to do the wedding, but I got to give the message, so I kind of got off the hook on a technicality. (laughs) And I gave the hope of the gospel. And fast forward several years. Easter service at a different church. My brother-in-law, Luke, hears the message of the gospel. And here's this, what we're talking about, the offer of grace and living water in Jesus and the pastor asks anybody who wants to receive it to stand up. It's over a thousand people in the room. And Luke stands up. And he walks down the aisle. Blew me away. And today, Luke is one of the most Christ loving, honoring husbands, fathers you could imagine. Now, I wanted to kick the guy away, you know? I'm not saying that's the path you should all take, but I'm saying God can do anything. Nobody's too far. And some of you have been on this journey and you got intellectual hangups, you got questions, and you've been wrestling with this, but you know now enough to believe. You know. But you're still holding them at arm's length. Others, you've been on the emotional journey and you've had pains and wounds of the past, and you, you know that Jesus wants to heal you, but you haven't crossed that line. When I got engaged to Aaron, when she said yes, which, hallelujah. <laughs> I intellectually knew that she was the right match for me. And I emotionally knew I wanted to spend my life with her. I had answered enough. I didn't know everything about her. I still don't. But I knew enough to know. And I did not know what our life would be like all these 25 years later. But I knew enough to know I wanted to be with her. But until I stood up, right? and said, I do, we were married. Can you imagine if I'd have said to her, look, look, I really, really love you, and I'm super committed to you, but let's just keep this between us. <laughs> I don't want to tell anybody. Let's not go public with that. No, I, there, there's a moment at which I said, I don't know everything, but I know enough to say I want her more than anything else. When, when the Bible talks about belief, that's what it's talking about. You don't have to have every question answered, but you come to the place where you say, I know enough, to know I want him. In Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul, who was like Nicodemus, highly educated, uh, highly respected Jewish leader, he writes this about his life. He says, whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith, belief in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That word rubbish, you see it in there? It's a funny Greek word, skubalon. It literally means human excrement. But no English translator can bring themselves to write that, so they say trash, rubbish, what, what he's saying is, all this stuff that I pursued to make me set myself feel good about myself and to prop myself up, I came to the realization that when you compare it to Jesus, it's worthless. I want him. I want him. And here's the great news. He wants you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. It's a little bit risky, but I've been praying about this, and I think it's the right thing to do. I know in my heart, some of you are here and you're like Nicodemus, you're trying to fit Jesus into your respectable life and it just isn't going to work and you know that. Others of you are here and you felt like an outsider your whole life and Jesus is saying, I want you to come in because I I welcome you in by my grace. And if that's you and you've never done this before, maybe you've been in church a long time and you have believed for a long time, but it's all been private and you've never... You've never made a profession. You've never crossed the line. You've never said, I believe. Then I'm gonna, I want to ask you right now to stand where you are and just say the words, I believe, and then sit back down. Well, you might think, well, why stand? 
Because it's a big deal. What would it take for someone to stand up in a room like this? You'd have to what? Really believe. Really believe that Jesus is who he said he was. That he really did die for you. That he really does love you. And he really does want to come into your life and fill you with grace and joy. So if that's you, and you know, I don't know everything, Jesus, I don't know all the answers, and I don't, I, but I know I don't want to trust myself anymore. I know I believe in you. But I'm going to ask you right now, stand up and just say two words. I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Not because it's the thing to do, but because you know in your heart you believe in Jesus and you've never made that statement before. You never professed it publicly. Anybody else? Now, there's no, the words aren't magic and standing isn't magic. Jesus saves you, not standing up and saying words. Jesus saves you. But sometimes we just need to cross a line and just say it, I believe. And here's the great news. God has been pursuing you like the woman at the well, he's been pursuing you. Like Nicodemus, he's been reaching for you. And in a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing one last song about our belief together. And if you, if you made that profession of faith for the first time this morning, if you felt like I just crossed the line this morning, we want to invite you to come down front at the close of the service because we have people that want to pray with you and give you something, uh, some, some resources to bless you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, none of us know all of who you are. How could we possibly? You're God. But thank you that you've allowed us to know enough to know that you are who you said you were. You have died in our place and risen from the grave and you will return. And trusting in ourselves, it just doesn't work. Thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you give us enough grace to have the faith to say, we believe. And that as John tells us in John 20, 31, by believing, we could have life in your name. We praise you and we thank you. Amen.